40 years or so. Uh, so I'm always up for something new. Well, this is definitely new. <laughs> and I just want to say, I hope you're safe and I hope everybody out, everybody out there on this, on this Zoom is very safe and sound and clearly we're all hunkering down. Yeah, you know, I'm a veteran of this Zoom thing. I, I have to tell you, a couple of weeks ago, uh, my wife surprised me with uh, a Zoom birthday party for my 70th. Um, so I had a Zoom um, 70th birthday party, um, and, and it was a lot of fun. Just about as much fun as the bookseller's uh, was, which I started to talk to you about a few minutes ago, uh, starting off by saying that in the best in the best sense of the word, it felt like science fiction. Um, all of these wonderful people that that I had never met. I mean, I had heard of friends, Fran Leibowitz, and 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 people like that, but I had never, uh, you know, come across except you know, across a counter at a bookstore, um, the people who just devote their lives of finding the unknown, the missing book, shall we say, you know, and, and how much it means to them. And I started to tell you that I was quite moved when someone said, and it's not just finding the book, it's finding someone who really wants to have it, even when he or she cannot afford it. You know, I, I, I didn't think, you know, there were people like that in this world. And, and it was very heartwarming, you know, to, to find them in the movie. Well, for me, I, 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 I couldn't agree with you more, Ned. It was, a, um, it was such a, a beautiful celebration of literary culture. For me, it wasn't as much as science fiction as it was a bit of my past. I mean, as I told you earlier, I, I'm not a collector like those guys. Uh, I've, I've never really been a collector. I mean, uh, there are collectors, people collect stamps and collect other objects. But what I always admired about people like that and the stores that they represent are the celebration of all things literary. A yeah. lot of them love the book as object. Uh, they love the stories behind each book. Many of them collect you know, specific areas within the book. Yes. Play. But, you know, one of the, the reason why it's not science fiction to me is that I think it's those people and that sensibility which got me involved in the book business from a very young age. Ah. When I was young, when I was very young, when I was in college uh, and I'd find myself in New York City, what I would literally do is start on the Upper West Side and then start walking Manhattan all the way <laughs> to the east side, to the Upper East Side. And I would literally stop in every single bookshop that was there. Many of like the Argosy, that three-story bookstore yes. you yeah. saw. The dwarfed, dwarfed by these. All the know, other places. Yes. The, the Strand was another one. And then if, if you remember from the film, that wonderful, um, the wonderful sign that said, wise men fish here. That was from the Gotham Book Mart, one of the great, great bookstores ah, that yes. was both used and new. Unfortunately, it's not there anymore. But that whole idea of people living for the book and for literary culture was something that I cut my teeth on very early. Remember, because before the internet, uh, people talked about it in the film, but before the access to books and used books and old books was so easy as it is now through the internet, uh, there was, it was always about the hunt. I would go into bookstores and I would rumble around and I would find things that I never saw before. But, but but Mitchell, a book itself, just just the physical book, can be a work of art. I mean, I've seen books that that uh, have been designed um, the way a motion picture would be designed. I mean, incredible stuff where people just uh, and and even in the older books, 
uh, the graphics and colors, hand drawing, um, you know, I, I'm thinking even of, of, of things like, you know, uh, the first edition Sherlock Holmes, you know, um, just the, 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 the level of attention to detail, the care, you know, um, I don't even know why, why, you know, Kindle exists. It should be outlawed. Well, you know, that film was made a couple of years ago and, and you talk about the Kindle. There is some very, to my way of thinking, good news about that. Um, and, and that is that the, the explosion of electronic books through eBooks has slowed down quite significantly. That's so good to the, hear. <laughs> the fear of the book being replaced uh, is uh, misfounded. I think the okay. book will always be here. It's a, it's a perfect object for doing what it does. What was so interesting about, what's so interesting about that world that we looked at in that film is that a lot of the books that you saw came from people who were able in the day to be able to amass libraries of right. those beautiful books, those yeah. beautiful bound books. Uh, I remember there was a bookshop that I used to go to in Boston called Bromer Booksellers. And they, for instance, specialized only in bindings, really huh. fine bindings. Okay. And, and, and during the Art Deco period and the Art Nouveau period and the Modernist period, some of the bindings are spectacular works of art. In and I can of imagine. Um, and some of the great, great illustrators who existed yes. in the teens, in the 20s, uh, Audrey Beardsley, um, uh, you could go on, you know, you could go on and on and on. So these, the illustrated book was another beautiful area. But as you saw in the film, you know, as people do who collect other things, it becomes very, very narrow in terms of the interest that people have or it can be very, very broad. There was that yeah. wonderful one guy who just collected every early printed thing of any sort whatsoever. <laughs> uh, and it didn't matter what condition it was in. Yeah. He just wanted an example of early printing. So right. it, can, it can get really, really, really um, specific as a book lover. But the thing, if you, if you like literary culture and you like books, uh, there's nothing more fun than poking around in a used bookshop or an old bookshop. Um, so there were a couple of levels that were worked on in that in that film. There were people who were dealing with highly expensive manuscripts. Then there yes. were people who were dealing with just that one guy who had all the warehouses in New Jersey. He had <laughs> yeah. Hundreds of thousands of books. He yeah. um, he just I loved when he pulled out that one book and it was. Um, it was um, um, Amish sex, which I thought was really yes, good. yes. All of a sudden, there was one of those. I, you know, I can't believe he pulled that by chance. He must have had that sticking out. I'm sure he did. But you know, the other interesting thing is there are a lot of people, a lot of writers. Uh, one in particular, Larry McMurtry. All of you know. Larry yes. And Dove and all owned a bookstore himself. Well, not only did he own a bookstore, but what he did, if you saw the last picture show the town that the last picture show was actually filmed in and took place in was his home. And he actually bought up the town and he filled the town's buildings with old books, like literally hundreds and thousands of old books. And you could go to that town and you could actually browse and buy stuff. There, you know, you, it was almost on the honor system. But, you know, there is an obsession about books. Now, Personally, myself, as I said, I'm an accumulator. So I just find myself picking, and you can see from just the background, it's, it's just my little office that I have here, but all over my house, I just have piles of stuff that have interested me. Uh, since I see so many books over the 40 years that have come through the bookshop. But I also, to this day, still go to old bookstores and find things. And so I put, I put together some things here that I thought, people might be interested in. Um, this, this probably falls into, into line with some of the things we saw in the film. This ah. is a beautiful clamshell 
edition. It's not an edition, but it's in a clamshell box of The Great Gatsby by ah. F. Scott Fitzgerald. And it does not, remember, he, somebody actually talked about what the value of the would be if it had a dust jacket. This is the yeah. first edition without the dust jacket, but it's really, really beautiful. And, um, and just holding this book and knowing that it's a first edition is really exciting. And it came, when I got it, it came with this clamshell binding box. Ah. And the book, and this often happens with first editions, the book fits right into this box. Okay. So, uh, you know, I just pulled this off the shelf so I could give you an idea. But my taste, you know, are those books that I loved as a kid. So this is a first edition of Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt ah. Vonnegut, a okay. book that I always loved. And I found this in a wonderful little bookshop in Manhattan, and they had it for sale uh, not too long ago. And then being a kid of the 60s and someone who grew up here in Miami, um, particularly during that period of the early 70s, I've always found myself drawn to kind of alternative culture during that period. So here's a book that Norman Mailer, if you remember back in the day, for those who are a little older, Norman Mailer used to write, he started out writing Armies of the Night. About yes. About the 68 convention. Yes. This is a lesser known book that only came out originally in paperback. It's called St. George and the Godfather. And it's about George McGovern and Richard Nixon's conventions. And it's all about Miami and Miami Beach. Huh. And, 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 and being a kid of 17 who was there for a lot of it, uh, I can tell you how accurate most of this is. And along those lines, here's a very early edition of a book called Revolution for the Hell of It by Abby Hoffman. Yes, I was going to say. And not to leave Jerry Rubin out, this is his doing <laughs> from those days as well. And also not to leave the great Hunter Thompson out, this is Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail, which My is gosh. the very same election. Um, this, this, so just things like that, just that interest me. But here I came across, these are not rare and hard, necessarily hard to find, but this is David Fairchild from Fairchild's Gardens. This huh. is a marvelous book called The World Was My Garden, Travels of a okay. Plant Explorer. And huh. the beautiful thing of this is when I came across it in someone's home, actually, what's beautiful about it is that it actually has David Fairchild's signature in it. Wonderful. An inscription as well. Um, again, not, you know, terribly valuable, but meaningful to me because of, you know, for the obvious reasons. And then, of course, because he was a friend of both of ours, Matt, and someone I admired very much is the author Charles Williford, who wrote yes. the Blues. And I came across one of his very early, early, early science fiction mystery pulp kinds of things called The Machine in Ward 11. My and gosh. The way it was originally as a pulp fiction. There's a great picture of the young Charlie Williford there as well on the back. That's great. Um, you know, these are the kind, some of the things I could probably pull a bunch of other off, but off the shelf. But these are some things that just, you know, as a book lover, as someone that is interested in finding things, these are the kinds of things that you can literally find in yeah. these stores, and they're not horribly expensive. Another one, you know, here's T.S. Eliot's old possum's book of practical cats. From oh my gosh. Andrew, Andrew Lloyd Webber made uh, cats from, and this right. is a first edition of that. Um, <laughs> I'm, a big, I'm a big lover of poetry, and this is Poetry Month, and uh, I've always loved the work of the guys like John Berryman and Robert Lowell, Here's uh, homage to Miss Brad, uh, Mistress Bradstreet. Okay. With a beautiful woodcut jacket as well. Um, anyway, that's, that's the kind of thing that anybody on this call can, can find. These are not yes. in the caliber of the hundreds of thousands of dollars. No. That many you know, I, wasn't there someone who bought a, a book for $15 that was worth 200000 or something right. like that? Right. When they talk about the hunt, that's what a lot of these guys are looking for. Right. Um, 
So, you know, it's, uh, you know, uh, th there are some wonderful characters in that film. There was the guy, we talked about him a little bit. If you saw the film, there was an in memoriam to one of the booksellers who uh, was in his early 60s when he died, but he started out uh, collecting books when he was at Yale University. And he opened up a bookshop that still is, is there in, uh, in New Haven. His right. name is, was William Reese. And uh, at, at my, when I was in college around the same time he was, I didn't know him. But to imagine that he was 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, and he was at auction buying $200,000 books. Incredible. Mind-blowing, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe we can turn it uh, over to uh, some of the people who are who are joining us or who have joined us. Javier, yeah. do you have any, quest yes, do you have any I do. questions for us? I do. Um, so the first question comes from uh, Lisa Riddle, who was wondering if you guys have any insight into the parallel world of public librarians and how that profession has changed over the years. Mitch? <laughs> wow, that's a really good question. I, I, I don't actually. I mean, uh, you know, I, I feel very simpatico with librarians and libraries. Uh, I love libraries and I love librarians. I think they're doing some amazing work. I can only talk maybe, maybe this would be helpful. I've, I've worked closely with the University of Miami Library and I know what they're beginning to do is figure out ways in which the library can be most useful. Um, and that means getting in some digital material or starting collections of their own for scholars to come and to be able to, um, to study. For instance, University of Miami has one of the great collections of Cuban literature. Uh, yes. Uh, there's a woman named Christina Fabretto, who is a wonderful librarian at the UM, who has started an amazing collection of all different kinds of things. I think Pan American Airlines is collected there. She's got a lot of what was called in the film ephemera. And ephemera, ah, yes. ephemera are, are, are things that are book related or right. are connected to something having to do with the book. Or to the era or to the era, it might not be the book itself, but it could be an right. advertisement, that sort of thing. Now in terms of general libraries, I know it's something that all of us need to make sure that we support uh, as much as we can. And in this, in this time of pandemic, I worry about you know, what's gonna happen uh, to the library because you know, one of the things that made perfect sense to me as we're all sheltering in place that you know, a lot of people who don't have means or, or who live in very crowded places or maybe are even homeless, uh, they need to have those public places where they have access to computers, to the internet, where they have access to books to be able to sit and read, access to newspapers. That has always been the public face of the library. A right. place where people can go, no matter what your socioeconomic background is, to be able to be educated and to be able to find a place of harbor. And those places are all closed now. And I worry about what happens to most people who found the library as one of those great good places where they used to be. Uh, so the second question comes from Karina Castillo, who is asking the two of you what your favorite bookshop in New York City is. Ah, oh, that's easy. Can I go first, Mitch? Of course. Okay. Uh, and this is from, from an amateur, not a professional. And I say amateur from the origin of the word amateur, a lover of. And uh, here goes a little story that, that uh, accompanies. Um, when Fernando uh, Trueba, my music producing partner, and, and Oscar-winning filmmaker, uh, and I coincide in New York for a recording or a visit, or it used to be a, a concert by Leonard Cohen. We always used to uh, leave some room uh, for a visit to the Strand Bookstore. And when I say leave some room, I don't mean like, you know, 
pull in for about 10 minutes, you know, uh, take a look at one or two shelves and leave. No, no. We're talking two or three hours, floor by floor, section by section, uh, philosophy, theater, literature, detective fiction, theater arts, uh, the movies, music, jazz. I mean, we go on forever. You know, and then if we have a little time left, we wander up to the third floor and um, that's where they have the first editions, you know, and then we pig out over there. But it's always, we, we always make a, a, a stop at the Strand Bookstore, um, for sure, whenever the two of us are in New York. Uh, it's like, you feel that civilization has not died, no matter how impoverished we, we might be in our different communities, that um, the memory of literary culture is still very much alive. And I know that's just one of, of, uh, of some that are still uh, very much alive in New York City, not as many as there used to be, as the film makes clear, but I have a special fondness for, for The Strand. How about yourself? Well, Nat, I share your love for The Strand. I mean, it's a store that's iconic. And Fred Bass, who was, it's actually in the hands now of his, his Fred Bass's daughter, Nancy, Wyden, Nancy Bass Wyden. So there's three generations now of The Strand. And as was pointed out in the film, that the row where The Strand is used to be filled with bookshops. Yes. Filled with used bookstores. And I think Fran Lebowitz said it very well in the film. Little old guys sitting outside, grumpy yes. old Jewish men not wanting to sell you anything is what they were doing. Um, it's a little dangerous for me to tell you my favorite bookstores because I know so many of the booksellers there that I don't want to point out one over the other. So maybe what I should do is tell you some of my favorite bookstores that are unfortunately not there anymore. And I think okay. that would have to start with the Gotham Book Mart. The Gotham ah. Book Mart was an iconic store for me. Uh, it was right in the middle of the Diamond District. And I can tell you some stories about that as well. It was the kind of bookshop, and many of your homes may be like this, but the kind of bookstore where there were three layers of books on the shelf. So you'd have to pull off the first layer. Then <laughs> yes. Second layer, and then in the back, were all these books that haven't been touched in like 40 years. Also, they had the foremost collection of Edward Gorey books because Gorey uh, used to hang out there a lot. The guy who did the old Possums, uh, a book of practice, the most recent edition of it. But the woman who owned it was a woman named Frances Stelloff. Frances Stelloff started that bookstore in the 30s. And actually people worked there like, like Allen Ginsberg for a little while and others, but she would, gather around her people like W.H. Auden, and they'd go down in the basement, and they would start talking about all of these books that were not permitted in the U.S. because of obscenity laws. Books right. by people like D.H. Lawrence and that sort of thing. And she actually brought suits, to, you know, against those obscenity laws to allow books like that in. And um, up until, it was, it's been around, it, it unfortunately, she died, and, and it, the guy who took it over, was sort of appointed by her to take it over, and he died, and the bookstore moved and it fell apart. Uh, but the story that I have to tell is at the very first Miami Book Fair, we had, many people don't know this, but we had Borges was confirmed to come to the first Miami Book Fair, and I was really excited about that. So the night before he was supposed to come, we hadn't heard anything from him, and this again is the day before, time before cell phones and the internet and all of that. We knew he was flying through New York, and, um, and then the day he was supposed to come, he wasn't on the flight. So we actually had to track him down, and we tracked him down to the Gotham Book Mart, which huh. is where he used to go on every trip to New York. He was blind, as you know, by then. Yes. And he would be read to by uh, people at the Gotham Book Mart would read to him. And while he was on the other, while we were calling the Gotham Bookmore to ask him where he was, we got the message that Senor Borges was too tired to make the last leg of his trip to Miami. 
So we lost out on having Borges help open up the Miami Book Fair. And the oh last I ever heard of where he was, he was in the Gotham Book Mart. So <laughs> is it more of a, uh, a love? Uh, well, you know, I have, a, I have a similar anecdote about another Argentinian, not as distinguished as, as Borges, but no slouch himself, Manuel Puig, uh, uh, who, uh, who we invited to have a conversation with um, Guillermo Cabrera Infante and Mario Vargas Llosa um, during the film festival. Interestingly enough, uh, Vargas Llosa uh, bowed out at the last minute without explanation. We always felt that he was prob he, he probably felt threatened to be in the company of uh, Manuel and Guillermo since they were encyclopedic uh, film minds. I mean, the two of them could go on forever. Uh, about movies and and Mario, even though he has a cursory interest in film, uh, is not that much of, of an aficionado. But in any event, what really what really clinched the deal for for Manuel Puig to come to come to the Miami Film Festival was not to have a conversation with Guillermo, uh, and, and they were very good friends but basically to be in touch with other film collectors and kind of trade uh, VHS cassettes of movies. So he kind of came with an empty suitcase and all he did while he was in Miami was meet these uh, collectors of movies and trade VHS tapes. And he had the greatest time. Uh, it was a wonderful conversation. And like I said, the two of them on stage can go forever. Um, was, but Sonia, it was, was Sonia Braga at that one as well? Did she come? I don't know if that year, if she came that year, but she was here. Uh, she was at the theater a couple of years ago uh, with one of her recent films called Aquarius. And she's a charming lady. She's, she's a lot of fun. We have a number of uh, mutual friends. Um, well, those, I'm sure those on this call know that UNAT introduced all of South Florida to the work of, uh, of uh, you know, like Kiss of the Spider Woman. And it's the, where I first saw all of those films myself. Well, you know, I'm, I, I'm also a bit of an accumulator and, and my mind is the receptacle of uh, a lot of film memories. And I do have a pretty, pretty extensive film library. And um, we're not talking about movies right now, but uh, that's a subject for a different conversation. Let's take up some, somebody else's question. So uh, next question is from Margarita Poza, who's asking about um, a book that was mentioned in the film that Bill Gates bought for $28 million. Uh, do you guys recall what that book was? No, I remember the whole thing, but I don't remember. Yes, I do remember. It was Leonardo da Vinci's, um, it was his book. It was, uh, uh, it was drawing, the Codex Lester. The Codex of Leonardo da Vinci. Yeah. Uh, I see somebody nodding. Yes, <laughs> that's the one. And, uh, but what was interesting, it shows you the value of books. You know, the earlier on, it was not interested. It, the, the price was not what it was the second time it was sold. Uh, clearly, they found a great buyer <laughs> in uh, Bill Gates. He was going to get it no matter what the price. All right, next question is from Arlene Easley, who uh, is asking Mitchell, um, are there any other books that you're planning to bring to the big screen once we're able to go out? Oh, wow, Mitch, the producer, that's great. Oh, yeah, right, well, yes, there are, in fact. There are some good ones. There's one that we've already... It scares me a little bit, you know, and I'm really sad about it, but it was scheduled to be released August 22nd, and it's called Let Him Go, uh -huh. by a writer named Larry Watson. Larry Watson's most famous book was a book called Montana 1948. Uh, this is a book that takes place in the West in the 60s, uh, and, and the film takes place then as well. 
And the film is wonderful. I've seen it probably a hundred times already, but it's not out yet. Uh, it was supposed to come out in August. It was a focus feature film. And I was hoping that I would twist Nat's arm to show it at the cinema, but I don't know what's gonna happen now. Um, it was not gonna be streamed until after it had its theatrical release, but now Focus is now moving a lot of films onto streaming. So you might be able to see it in your home. It stars Diane Lane and Kevin Costner. And it, they're both really wonderful in this film. Well, I hope um, that things change by then. I mean, uh, the last we spoke about it, it was uh, it was late. It was a late August release, right? Like August twentieth or something. Yeah, like we've been in touch with Focus, and they haven't really made a decision yet okay. with what they're going to do. But there is one that's right now. For some of you, who might have missed it. It's a really great film with Al Fanning called All the Bright Places, and that's being streamed right now on uh, on um, on Netflix, and it. Uh, you know, we, you know, you sit and you have calls with, with Netflix and they don't give you much information. But for the first 10 days that that film came out in late February, it was number two in the entire world on the Netflix yeah. platform. It was no, based, and, and, and based and on a young adult you, film. You will, you, will, uh, you will never say that yourself, but it had uh, excellent reviews. Thanks, man. Okay, we have, I think, our final question, uh, and it's from Lisa Riddle again, and she's curious, um, because the film focuses on New York City, if you guys have any comments you can say about whether Washington, D.C. is a similar thriving book collection slash bookstore market that the movie could um, focus on, uh, specifically all of the shops that are mixed into the row houses or, or around the Capitol. Hmm. You know, at the time that I lived in D.C. for a short period of time, two, you know, for two years in the late seven, in the late seventies, early eighties, that's where Larry McMurtry had his bookstore. Actually, uh, there was also a marvelous secondhand bookshop around Dupont Circle called Second Story Books. I'm not familiar personally with the bookstores around the Capitol. Uh, I know that D.C. is thriving in so many different ways now, or at least it was. Um, so I assume that there probably are some amazing bookstores. Many of them probably focus on nonfiction, things having to do with politics, but I'm not surprised by that. You know, typically wherever there are really great libraries are where you've had really great bookstores because people could, could purchase libraries from various places, which brings me to the point, the last point maybe that was brought up in the film, and that is that so many of these places are, are being harmed right now because of the internet. Yes. Like, like it hurt new bookstores, it's also hurt used bookstores. Because, you know, you can literally go online now and, you know, just about find anything you want. So the way a lot of bookstore, used bookstores have actually made it, or rare bookstores, is many of them have an online presence. So a lot of them have put what they have online the way art dealers have and others. So um, they're able to not, not rely so much on their physical spaces. It's sad for me because I love spaces and I love bookstores themselves, but, uh, but that is a bit of the way of the world now. And by the way, how have you been uh, in the midst of the pandemic you yourself, Mitch? Well, per personally, my family's fine. You know, everyone's been really good. I was able to rescue my daughter from New York City and get her down here before the craziness. My sons live here and we're doing well. Um, you know, the bookstores are having a really rough time where all of the stores are closed right now. Uh, we were able to get some of that PPP money, which will allow us you know, the PPP thing, I could, we could do a whole Zoom just on that, but it's a little bit awkward because it only allows you to use, it restricts the money you get to eight weeks after you've gotten. So I don't know, you know, I don't know, the, you know how, how much, how open we will be within eight weeks. <laughs> but in the, in the meantime, I'll be able to pay payroll and all of that. But, 
you know, most small, we're like every other small business. We live week to week and, uh, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're a little bit uh, in a precarious state the way most bookstores are in most small business. We do have an advantage in that our online business is open and you can purchase through booksandbooks.com. And we have as big a selection online as anyone. And, and we hope to do curbside service in a little while once it becomes more safe. So you could call the bookshop and somebody could run a book out to you or leave it on the curb. Um, but if you do order online, we're pretty good in getting you your book pretty quickly through booksandbooks.com. And we can get you books uh, the way any other uh, online uh, uh, group can. I won't mention specifically the other one, but- I, I, I was hoping you wouldn't. <laughs> but we, we, and you know, if there's something to be said, if you're, if you're not living in Miami and you're watching this, you should support your online I mean, your, your local indie bookstore, because you often don't know what you have until it's gone. That's and right. None of us want to see any of these things go, including our wonderful cinema that we work so symbiotically with, uh, which is across the street from our Carl Gable store. And Lord knows when people are going to start wanting to sit next to one another in a movie theater. I'm hoping it's sooner than later. I hope we find a cure or we find a vaccine which will make people feel comfortable enough to do that. Well, you know, being a movie lover, I believe in happy endings some of the time. Mitchell, um, what about the, the book fair? Has the quarantine impacted it? Well, the, the jury is still out on that. We're still, we're still planning as if we're gonna have a book fair, but none of us know what the world is gonna be like in November, and if we don't, we're gonna do what we're starting to do now already. If you sign up for our newsletter, you will find that we're gonna be doing virtual book tours. Uh, it starts, I think, tomorrow night is our first one with um, Madeline Albright is gonna be in conversation with Donna Shalala. So you can go to our website and you can find out about that. Uh, and if the book fair does not is not able to be pulled off, we will have an amazing slate of writers that you'll be able to watch virtually uh, during that period. I certainly hope that we're able to do it. We haven't had to cancel one book fair in 38 years, 38 book fairs. So it'd be horrible to have to cancel the first one. Well, Mitch, um, I'm glad some months ago you asked me for a list of films that you might have missed watching. Because right now, I know you have a few to catch up on uh, in your spare time. But I wanted to thank you so much uh, because I knew that there were people all over South Florida that were just waiting for the right excuse uh, to tune in and listen to an old friend talk about his favorite subject, books. Well, and uh, I, I include myself in that list. Um, so be well. Take care of yourself. Uh, say hello to everyone at the store. You know, my good friend, Christina. Um, and I hope we see each other uh, on either side of the street. Yes. Good health to everybody out there. And uh, thank you all for, for, for tuning in. And, uh, you know, if you want any additional information about book collecting or anything like that, you can always reach out to me. My email is mitchell at booksandbooks.com and I'm happy to continue the conversation any way that you'd like. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Javier. Oh, thank you, yes, Mitchell and Matt. Javier for doing yes, this. Javier, um, yes. Yeah. You look uh, great with those, uh, with those earphones on. Uh, I have a story about those that I'll tell you another time. Let's, um, hope, <laughs> let's hope that we, we need to do more of these, Nat. We need to do more of these through the film uh, through the film uh, through the movie theater. It'd be one well, you know, we have a pending date with one of our guilty pleasures where movies are concerned. It's a mad, 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 mad world. Oh, I know. One of and I know the world, the world is going to be just eager <laughs> to see something like that after all of this is done. Absolutely. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Nat. Thanks, Javier. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, if you have well, any, any feedback about this or any more, anything else that you'd like to participate with us, please feel free to reach out. Uh, you can reach out directly to me. My email is javier at gablecinema.com. Uh, we look 
forward to doing this again. Have a good night, everyone. Thank good you. Good night. Good night, guys.